Brother Tommy and Brother Rocky are going to continue to play. Won't you step out tonight, shake some more hand, make them feel welcome at church tonight? Would you do that? Go ahead.
Anybody got a song on your heart tonight? Testimony on your heart? Nobody? Well, you pray for me. I've had a song on my heart this afternoon. I'm going to try. I don't sing because I think I can because... in a storm. How many of you know that's true? That's what this song talks about. It talks about the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when the storm came. But I'm thankful that there was a way out of that storm, aren't you? You listen to the words of this song. Cross in the calm sea with Jesus The disciples were getting concerned The wind started violently blowing but he was asleep in the stern. Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. Jesus arose when they called him and said to them, where is your faith? Because you right there we're gonna keep singing because you prayed all night because you held on with all of your might child your cries have awoken the master oh he knows your voice lift your hands it's time to you held on with all of your might child your cries have awoken the master how many of you is glad that he knows your voice amen amen take your bibles tonight with me to mark chapter number two Mark chapter number 2, tonight if you turn your Bibles there, the Lord has burdened my heart with this message tonight, and I hope and pray that you've come praying for the Lord to speak to your heart, and uh, I'm looking at everything right now that's going on in our world, looking right now at everything that is going on in the nation of Israel, looking right now at scripture being played out right before our very eyes, I would dare say that time is drawing near. I would dare say that time is short and the church needs to be busy. It's easy, I, I've told you before that I'm not a news watcher, uh, but it's easy to tune those things out. It's easy if you're like me and you don't want to pay for cable, somebody say amen right there, you don't have the news to watch. It's easy to not look on Facebook at all of these things, but the reality is right before you and I, time is running out. 
With the help of the Lord tonight, the Lord has burdened my heart to preach that thought. Time is short. I told you this morning about our, our illustration of going to Hobby Lobby and being stuck there forever, and I was in trouble when I got home for using that illustration. But I did get my hourglass that the Lord sent me to Hobby Lobby for. I just haven't reset it yet. So we're going to let it reset, and then I'll use that illustration, all right? Mark chapter 2, stand to your feet if you're able tonight in reverence of the Word of God. Look at the first 12 verses of this chapter. Very familiar passage of Scripture. I desire your prayers tonight. The Bible said, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doeth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and walk and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that there were they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. You may be seated tonight. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for allowing us back into your house on Sunday night. Lord, I'm thankful that we've not given up on Sunday night service, but I'm thankful, Lord, that we still believe in this day and hour that you desire, Lord, to meet with us on Sunday night just like you do on Sunday morning. And, Lord, with all of the craziness and chaos in our world today, Lord, we sure do need you two times. Uh, Lord, I need you two times on a Sunday, Lord, to be encouraged and to be uplifted. And, Lord, my heart is burdened today. I don't know when the coming of the Lord will be, but, Lord, I have a Bible that tells me that it is closer than I think it is in this very moment. And, Lord, it's easy to, Lord, distract our minds from these things. It's easy, Lord, to be busy, Lord, but I pray today uh, that you would help us, Lord, to realize that time is running short, and because time is running short, the church needs to be busy. Lord, I pray tonight that you would preach this word, Lord, through me as your servant, that you'd sit me to the side and give me unction and liberty, and, God, that you would burden our hearts again for lost people. I pray you'd bind the enemy, bind distractions, and, Lord, bind any thought that's not from you tonight. And I beg you, Lord, I invite you again to meet with us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. I can turn this hourglass, and I, I will, but I will sit it on the organ just in case I shake the pulpit and I don't want to break it. I, I can turn this hourglass, and I didn't time it for you. All of them are different. Some have more sand, some have less sand. But the reality is, before I finish preaching tonight, time will have ran out on that hourglass. Uh, we could pick it up, and uh, some of you might try to shake it to get the sand to fall quicker, to get me to get done preaching quicker. We can turn it upside down, flip it around. But nevertheless, that hole is the same size in that glass uh, to allow that sand to fall at the same exact time. May I say that it could be very well before I get done preaching that time could run out I, I won't re-preach what I preached this morning but looking and watching the news yesterday afternoon about everything that's happening in Israel preacher stuff happens in Israel all the time yes it does uh, and that's even more of the eschatological point that the end times uh, have arrived uh, but if you go and you look and I, I won't preach this tonight but you can look uh, and we can see the fulfillment of scripture uh, we can look up. I was listening to a preacher after church today, uh, and he was preaching on that passage of Scripture that I referenced this 
morning to the disciples, uh, when will the end be? They asked Jesus, uh, and he said, look up right now, uh, for your redemption is drawing nigh. Uh, we can look at the scripture and read that there will be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, we can read the scripture that brother will rise against brother, uh, and that people will call good evil and evil good. Uh, we can read Paul's words to Timothy that in the end days men will heap to themselves having itching ears uh, only wanting to hear uh, what they want to hear uh, I, I mean to say nothing about nobody tonight but that's why Southern Baptist churches and missionary Baptist churches uh, are depleting across our nation and churches like Joel Osteen's church are full on Sundays uh, because people are hearing what they want to hear but we need to hear what we need to hear somebody say amen right there uh, it's easy to think well uh, the preacher's been saying since I was a little boy uh, that Jesus is coming again uh, and hear me I can go to Halls Baptist Church uh, sitting about halfway back in the sanctuary uh, where brother Kitts would preach his lungs out to that back wall uh, every Sunday morning uh, y'all think I get excited and hack sometimes uh, this man was a hack and hiccup and preacher for the glory of God Roger you know what I'm talking about uh, and he would tell me that Jesus was coming again uh, and I remember I would get so scared in my seat uh, because I knew I could do nothing to prevent him from coming. Now I'm born again and I get excited, Don, when people talk about Jesus coming again. But I can't prevent his coming. Can I say that I've already preached through half of that time, maybe? Time is running short right before you and me. It's time for the church to be the church. Biblically, it's not enough. For you and I to sit inside of these walls. Biblically, we should sit inside of these walls. But when we decide to in purpose in our hearts to live for Jesus, we will take it outside of these walls. We get a very beautiful picture tonight uh, of this man that the Bible said is sick of the palsy. In the Greek, that means this man is a paralytic. Uh, he can't do anything for himself. Uh, he can't get up and get to where help can be. And I love the picture that the Bible said that Jesus was in the house. Uh, we, we can read in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew the same account, but we don't know whose house he's in. But thank God he was in the house. Uh, how many of you are glad that Jesus comes? of the house and I thought I find it interesting that it said it was noised abroad uh, that he was in the house uh, and everybody was coming around and preacher why were they doing that it wasn't because all of them wanted to hear his message uh, if we read John chapter 6 uh, it's because some of them just wanted what he could give to them uh, and their four friends uh, the Bible said that this man that was a paralytic was born of four uh, that means he was carried by four uh, and these friends realized that their friend could not get to Jesus uh, and they purposed in their heart uh, that it was their mission uh, to get that friend to Jesus. Uh, may I say what a picture that is for you and I tonight uh, as the born again redeemed of God washed in the blood heaven bound. Uh, it is our mission uh, to go to those that can't get to him that don't know how to get to him and that even don't know that they need him and to bring them to him. Amen. That's a lot of hymns but thankfully that's Jesus. It was noise that he was in the house. And verse number 2 said there's no room to get in. Verse number 2 said that he preached the word unto the people and that you couldn't even get in the door. I, I'm thankful that Jesus was preaching, don't you? I, I, I'd pray that Jesus come preach tonight. I'd rather listen to Jesus preach any time. Uh, and he's preaching unto the people. And then I see the first thing tonight. Uh, because time is running short uh, of what you and I ought to do as the people of God. Look at verse number 3. Uh, the Bible said that they come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy which was born or carried by four these men went I was thinking about using an illustration tonight but Dawson Alex and Jacob are all doing what I'm preaching right now in Knoxville so I don't have my strong men to make the illustration for me but they're carrying this paralytic man four of them 
and they get to the house. They purpose in their heart, I need to get this man to Jesus. Now let's establish some context here. Jesus had not yet walked the Via De La Rosa. Jesus had not yet gave his life on Calvary. Jesus had not yet got out of the tomb three days later. But Jesus had explicitly stated that's what his life was for. Uh, that he would die a criminal's death. Uh, that he would rise again so he could save a bunch of criminals uh, and turn them into new people. Uh, but their main concern was that their friend could be healed. That he could walk again. Before it's mine and your concern to get somebody physical help, we need to get them spiritual help. They carried their friend and brought him to Jesus. Preacher, that's a wonderful picture. But you're the preacher. It's your job to carry people to Jesus. Well, that's true. But biblically, it's your job to carry people to Jesus. Preacher, I don't know about that. I got an arsenal of scripture tonight about how it's our job to tell others about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, we have the very familiar passage of Scripture, the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. Uh, I said not the Great Suggestion, but the Great Commission, where Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always. In Acts chapter number 1, in verse number 8, uh, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told the disciples, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, uh, and you shall be witnesses unto me, uh, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, Romans chapter number 10, in the middle of the Roman road. Uh, in verse number 14, uh, the apostle Paul said, how shall they call on him uh, in whom they have not believed? Uh, and how shall they believe? Even him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Preacher, I told you it's your job. Well, the Greek language, that don't mean me when it uses that word preacher. You know what the word gospel is in the Greek? It's euon gileon. You know what that word means? Dr. Goodman taught me what that word was. You know what that word means? It means a herald. You know what it means? We know it means good news, but you on Gileon, it means that they were a herald, and you know what they would do? They'd do what a lot of us be scared to do. They would walk through the middle of town anytime there was good news, uh, and that herald would proclaim good news, good news, good news. Uh, you know what Paul is saying today? Uh, they can't believe on him unless they hear about him, and they can't hear about him unless they're told about him. And how are they going to hear about him without a you on Gileon, without a herald, without somebody? It would be un orthodox for you to do it but I dare you if the spirit of God tells you to to walk through somewhere and just chant good news good news good news and somebody say what's the good news that Jesus isn't in the grave but he's seated on the right hand side of the father uh, that Jesus isn't on the cross but he paid for all of our sin debt there on that old rugged cross so that we could be saved think about that for a minute how are they going to hear unless you and I tell them I can reach people for Jesus with his help, but all of us can reach a whole lot more people for Jesus with his help. The Bible didn't stop there. The Bible continues to go on to tell us uh, in the book of Colossians, Paul said to the church of Colossae in chapter 1, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man. He's talking about how Christ is the hope of glory in verse 27. And he said, we preach him, uh, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect uh, in Christ. Paul told the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, I exhort you, brethren, to warn them that are unruly, uh, to comfort the feeble-minded, to support the weak, and to be patient toward all men. The Bible commands you and I not, we are not saved to sit, we are saved to serve. Uh, we are not saved to live for ourselves, but we are saved to live sin. Uh, don't you want to tell somebody else about what God has done for you? You know what I hear a lot? Preacher, you ought to go eat there. That was a good restaurant. Preacher, you, you ought to go find this, go to this place. This is where I found the, the good dress clothes on sale. Now, I like a good sale, but you know what we don't hear a lot? Preacher, I want to go tell somebody about a man named Jesus that I met and changed everything about me. What about those two men on the road of Emmaus? 
Jesus appeared unto them, was walking with them, and he said, why are you of a sad countenance? And they said, have you not heard uh, how Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb? Uh, and the whole time Jesus was thinking, I am that I am, is sitting here talking to you. That was me. I'm not dead, but I'm alive. Uh, and they went in and sat down in the house. They begged the man to stay with them. And at the table, Jesus broke bread. And then he disappeared. What did they say? Did not our heart burn within us? Our heart should burn within us to tell other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's not where the Bible ends in Thessalonians, but the Bible will continue to go on to command you and I. Jesus said in the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What's that song the little kids used to stand up and sing? This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. They go on to hide it under a bushel. No, I'm not going to let Satan blow it out. You know what the problem is today? A lot of us have let Satan blow that light out. A lot of us have taken it. Jesus used the parable and he said, What man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel or puts it under his bed? Now let's get in our context. You're going to turn a flashlight on and put it under your bed. What good is that going to do? What good is it a Christian that does not shine their light for lost people to see? Preacher, I don't encounter lost people. Yes, you do at the gas pump. You encounter a captive audience of lost people. At the grocery store, that person checking your groceries out, you're more than likely encountering a lost person. If you go buy groceries at Food City, I, I, I can help you and tell you a few that are lost because I've tried to witness to them and they slammed the door in my face proverbially and said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I, I can tell you about a few of them that need you, those co-workers that you work around every day. I guarantee you that some of them are lost. Those people that are in your family, maybe that live in your household under your roof, they need somebody to get them to but so many times, we just cover our eyes. Lord, there's plenty of time, but if we look right now, I don't know, about 15 minutes into the sermon, time is almost gone. But there's one that stands out to me more than any of the other verses, and that is in Ezekiel chapter number 33. The Lord warns the prophet Ezekiel that he is to be the watchman sitting on a tower. The original context of a watchman in the Old Testament times, uh, uh, maybe you've watched movies where, or maybe you've been to old prisons where there is the watchtower uh, uh, where the guard would sit with the spotlight and he would shine it and make sure that nobody was escaping. In Old Testament times, uh, the picture of the watchman was to see if the enemy was coming. Uh, and the Lord told Ezekiel, that if the watchman got lazy or lethargic on the job uh, and the enemy slept in, crept in uh, and killed one of those in his army and took them away or took them away captive, that the blood would be required at the watchman's hand. Uh, what's the Lord telling Ezekiel? Uh, that in that time, if the watchman failed to do his job, his life was required. But the Lord made a spiritual implication to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 33, verse 7, he said, Son of man, I've set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth. Listen to him. He said, Warn them. May I echo the words of the Lord on a Sunday night? The people outside of these walls, uh, the statistics, friend, of the state of Tennessee alone uh, and the lostness in our community, the, the, the statistics that the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board gives us, uh, uh, that Brother Rock Collins, one of the greatest preachers I've ever listened to, uh, is our harvest field, a ministry leader for the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board, uh, and he will preach about the statistics of the some million people living in the state of Tennessee uh, and over half of them don't know Christ. Uh, hey, if you want to know the statistic of a few years ago, maybe it'll help us understand it. Uh, how many of you have ever been to Neyland Stadium? How many of you have ever watched football and seen Neyland Stadium? Fill it full and cut it in half. Half of those people are dying and going to hell. Don't you think we need to be the watchman on the tower? May I echo tonight, if you don't hear anything that I've preached, maybe I'll change my sermon title. Warn them, warn them, warn them. He said, I've set you as a watchman. And he said, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou 
thou doest not speak to warn the wicked from this way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. But he went on to say, Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. What is the Lord telling Ezekiel? He said, I am not going to require your physical life if this, if, if this person uh, slips away in the hands of the enemy. But I need you to hear me tonight. We're not standing in a proverbial watchtower looking for uh, Russia or China or a physical enemy to come and steal our army away. There are people that are doing that tonight. Thank God for them. And you and I are sitting in church free because of that. But you and I are standing in the spiritual watchtower built from heaven. And we are looking for an enemy that's trying to come. An enemy that's trying to snatch away souls. Do you know what happens every Sunday morning? A lot of times we can't see it. A lot of times we're so distracted. A lot of times when somebody is coming to pray at an altar and lay down burdens, we're too worried. And I, I, I see everything from up here. And I've been out there and I've done it too. I'm speaking in love. We're too worried about watching that person instead of examining our own heart. Am I right sometimes? You know what's happening in that moment after the gospel is preached? The enemy is in here just like Jesus is, distracting our mind, trying to pull that lost person. I remember when the Holy Spirit began to deal with me at the age of 14, and that preacher would get up and preach. My mind would chase rabbit after rabbit after rabbit, and the Lord would bring me right back to hear what I needed to hear. And I remember of the days that the Lord began to draw me. Anybody remember those days? When I knew... I didn't look over at somebody beside me and say, Who, who's, whose voice is that? I didn't know him, but I knew his voice. And I remember how distracted I would get. I, I remember that I would leave the sanctuary sometimes, just pretend that I needed to go to the restroom so that I could get away from the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know what I found? He's in the sanctuary and he was in the bathroom. Somebody say amen. He was still speaking to me. And somehow I would walk all the way down that hallway. If, if you'd go in the hallway of our old church and walk all the way to the back corner of the top hallway, the back room, that's about how far it was to the bathroom. And somehow I could steer heel, steer heel that old man yelling from that sanctuary, telling me that I needed to be saved. I am thankful that he was the watchman on the tower. But you and I are the watchman on the tower. And this is what the Lord told Ezekiel. If you see somebody and I tell you to warn them, blood is in you. And when I say old man, I'm not being derogative. That man of God made an impact on my life that I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for him. And I'm glad that he's standing in heaven today and my blood ain't on his hands because he told me what the Lord told him to tell me. But how many times, can we be honest with the Lord? I'm not asking you to raise your hand or tell me because I ain't going to tell you. How many times the Lord has given us an opportunity and we've made an I was having lunch with a friend the other day, and uh, we, we were talking about this very thing. And we were talking about how so often the Lord puts it in our heart to speak with somebody, and we overcomplicate it. We find the door out. We do not do what the Lord tells us to do. And could we testify that we walk away feeling miserable? Hello. Anybody in here, God ever told you to do something, and you chickened out, and you didn't do it? But how many times the Lord leads us to bring that friend to Jesus and we do it and you feel like you can fly through the air. Isn't it a good feeling when you obey the Lord? I want you to see that these four friends saw an obligation to bring their friend to Jesus. But I want you to know that you and I have an obligation to bring people. Nowhere does it tell us in the early scriptures of the gospel or the end of the Old Testament or anywhere for that matter that these friends were commanded to bring their friend to Jesus that his paralysis might be healed uh, and that he might be able to walk again. But they saw the need. Uh, church, do you see the need to bring people to Jesus? Uh, maybe as I'm preaching right now, you got somebody on your mind uh, and you know that you need to bring them to Jesus. Uh, you know that you need to talk to them. Uh, uh, we need to warn them. But look at verse number 4. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, 
And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Can I say this tonight? It's not always going to be easy to bring people to Jesus. It's not always, are y'all hearing me tonight? It's not always going to be convenient to bring people. Matter of fact, if you want to win somebody for the Lord, you have to be willing to put effort into it. If you want to win somebody to the Lord, you have to be willing to sacrifice your time. I can testify, not from a pastoral standpoint, but from a Christian standpoint, that if you want to win somebody to Jesus, you have to be willing to answer the phone late at night when they have the questions of trying to figure out. Sometimes one time will be sufficient. Preacher, how is it that sometimes I can talk to somebody about Jesus and they're ready to receive it? Or other times, if Dawson was here tonight, he'd share too. We've tried to tell people about Jesus and they slammed the door in our face. Preacher, what is the difference? Because Paul said that those in Corinth were getting divided because some said, I belong to Paul. Some said, I belong to Peter. Some said, I belong to Apollos. And Paul said, I'm straight. And he said, Apollos may have planted and I may have watered, but God gave the increase. You know what happens when we talk to somebody and they're ready to receive it? We're coming and we're harvesting that crop. Somebody else done planted. Somebody else done watered it. But what do we do in the moments when we try to talk to somebody? Those cashiers I just mentioned, and they want it nothing to do with it. I'm simply trying to dig up a little hole just to plant the seed so that somebody else can come along and water it. I think about what we would have done, what I would have done. Can you imagine four people carrying this grown paralytic man, and they come to the door of the house, and there's no way in? Well, Lord, I tried lay the bed down and go about our merry way. How many times we do that? Lord, I, I, I tried my best to dip them to you, but I, I couldn't, so I, I'm going to give them to you. But watch this tonight. Jesus doesn't want you and I just to lay the person down when it gets hard, uh, to lay the person down when they don't want to hear what we have to say, uh, to lay the person down when we're rejected, to lay the person down when we're weary of witnessing to them. But Jesus wants you and I tonight uh, uh, to keep trying uh, and to put effort into it uh, and to put time into it. To it uh, and to put prayer into it that we might win them for Jesus. When is the last time that you and I have put effort into telling other people about Jesus? Miss Bobby Joe, I need to get a microphone because mine is done broken on the back of my head. I'm going to go get one out of this room. You turn it on for me, if you will. Amen. We'll just keep on preaching from here. How's that? I got the red one. That's all right. That's just the devil don't want me to preach, but that'd be fine. How many times have you and I went to tell people about Jesus only to be rejected and only be to turn away, but to keep putting in the effort and to see the crop grow? What would have happened if they would have said, well, it's gotten too hard now. I've brought him as far as I can. Can I say that the truth of the matter is tonight that sometimes the Lord will lead you and I to witness to somebody until we can't witness anymore. There's been times in my life that I have witnessed to dear friends and witnessed to dear friends and tried to get them to come back to the fold of God, those that have walked away for the Lord, Brother Curtis, to say, Matthew, you can't do anymore. That doesn't mean we keep stop praying for them. But we mean we pray that God does stuff with them, draws them. But there's been times that I've wanted to quit telling people about Jesus. Only for Jesus to say, Matthew, you're not done yet. And to see the crop flourish. Can I say this tonight? I know that he would be okay with me seeing it, saying it. On Sunday mornings, Roger's done had to move to that side. I've had to move to this pew. And the front pew's being overtaken because these front two pews are so full. Why, preacher? Because of one man that came to Jesus. I, he'd be fine with me telling you that I remember uh, times of, uh, of telling this friend about Jesus and, and they were always so respectful, but they didn't need it, didn't believe it. Oh, and then I, I left the job and Dawson kept doing the job and Rodney kept doing the job. 
and to watch the Lord deal with this person's heart and them to walk into church and to be honest, something in my little faith that I didn't think that I would see and to see them kneel at this altar and to get saved, to get born again, then to baptize them and then to watch the fiancé walk in and fall on this altar two, three weeks ago and trust Christ as their Savior and baptize her, then to watch Mama get down in the baptismal water Sunday and to baptize her. Preacher, what was happening? It was because there were some people that refused to give up because they saw the need to tell other people about Jesus and Jesus took it and ran with it. Praise His name. I got a lot of preaching to do so I got to move quick. Can you think about this tonight with me? Preacher, I just don't know if it's worth it. People are dying and going to hell right now in this moment. I preach this morning that, that I'm going somewhere. How many of you are glad that you're going somewhere because you know Jesus? But those that don't know Jesus, they're going somewhere too. And they're not going to a place, Roger, where there's no sickness or sorrow or pain. They're not going to a place where they can sing right now. What a day that's going to be. They're not going to the road. They're not traveling the road that ends at the Father's house. They're not going to a place of endless splendor where there's no night, where there's no enemy, where there's no burdens, but they're headed to a place where all of eternity, the Bible says that there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the Bible says that there's outer and utter darkness, where the Bible says that the presence of God will pour out his wrath for all of eternity you know something I, I'm going I'm to digress here and get off of it you know something I cannot stand yes preacher I want to know when I hear people say I wish you would just go to hell if you've ever said that friend you ought to evaluate that right now it should not be the wish of any of us that anybody goes to hell I believe the old preacher of yesteryear said if God would lift the lid off of hell for about 10 seconds, all of us would get busy for Jesus. Can I encourage you tonight that it is our command to bring people to Jesus? And can I encourage you tonight that when it's hard trying to bring people to Jesus, don't give up on them. Look at verse number 5. Preacher, why do I need to bring people to Jesus? When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. We should bring people to Jesus because he's their only hope. Acts 4, 12 said, There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved, but it's only that the name of Jesus. Paul said in the book of Philippians that Jesus humbled himself and put on the fashion of a man and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself even to the point of the death on a cross that they might be saved. Watch this. These friends were trying to bring their friend to Jesus that he could be physically healed. But when he got to Jesus, he got spiritually spiritually healed Uh, before you and I can ever meet the physical needs I'll say it again Jesus has to meet the spiritual needs we ought to bring people to Jesus because he's their only hope Buddha's not their hope Muhammad's not their hope Allah is not their hope Uh, only Jesus is their hope why preacher because all them little G gods brother Brian talked about in Sunday school They're dead in a grave somewhere. But that old song says, if you go over that tomb where old Joseph left him lay, guess what? It's still empty. Preacher, where is he? He's seated on the right-hand side of the Father. He's seated in heaven looking over the banisters of heaven right now willing to save any of those that come to him. Look down at verse number 11. Let me get where I'm going tonight. Verse number 11, uh, verse number 6 through verse number 10. The Pharisees see it and they begin to squabble against Jesus. Can I say that in our work of evangelism, evangelism, telling other people about Jesus, there's always going to be those that will squabble. Have you ever have you ever not done something Jesus told you to because you're afraid what somebody else is going to think? Amen or oh me. There have been times in my life, Brother David, 
that the Lord has said, Matthew, I, I will never forget. I'm trying to preach quick, but the Lord's giving it to me quicker than I get it out. I'll never forget being in New York City on the subway as a 17, 18-year-old young preacher still wet behind the ears, and I still am. And that subway was full of people. There was homeless people. There were drug addicts. There were people uh, that I will not use terminology to name them inside of that subway. And I will never forget my daddy looked over at me, and he said, Son, right now would be a really good time. To preach. I stood there and thought about it. You know what the Holy Ghost said? Matthew, why don't you tell them about me? And I'm ashamed to tell you. You know what I said? Mm. Lord, I can't speak. I wish I could go back to 18 years old sometimes and maybe just shout out John 3.16. No telling who was in that subway who needed to hear what Jesus could do for them. Can I tell you this tonight? That if the Lord is moving your heart to talk to somebody else, He's moving their heart to receive what you have to say. All of us have times. Lord, I, I'm late for work. Lord, I, I'll do it on the way home. When you and I walk away from the opportunity, the opportunity may never come again. Look at verse 11. Jesus said, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. The Pharisees were squabbling, and Jesus said, uh, He said, Is it easier for me to say your sins be forgiven, or is it easier for me to say take up your bed and walk? And so Jesus said, So that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth. He said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And He said, Take up your bed, take up your couch, uh, and begin to walk. Can you imagine being that paralytic for the first time ever in his life? Uh, he began to feel some tingling down in his legs. Uh, he began to move his fingers, uh, and he popped up to his feet. Watch his faith. He didn't say, Lord, I can't walk. Uh, but Jesus said it, and I preached this morning. I'll say it again. Jesus said it, and he believed it. He got up. He took up his bed, and he began to walk in verse number 12. Oh, everybody in the house began to give God the glory for what he was able to do. May I say this, uh, that you and I not, should not only bring people to Jesus that they might be saved, uh, but you and I ought to bring people to Jesus that are burdened down by the trials of life uh, because it doesn't matter the trial or the sickness or the problem or the worry or the financial thing if we bring them to Jesus he's able to help them how many of you ever come to Jesus and got help cast all you care on him because he cares for you come unto me all you that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy and my yoke is light we ought to carry people in prayer I'm talking about Christians now we ought to carry our fellow brothers and sisters to the throne of God and say Lord they need help I don't just see tonight the command to bring people to Him. I don't just see tonight that we need to because He can forgive their sins and He can help their problems. But I, I just thought for just a minute, and I'm done preaching, I, I thought about three people in Scripture, and I won't even turn there and read all of them. I thought about three people in Scripture that had a burden for people to get right. I know the hourglass says that I'm done out of time, but you bear with me here. We'll just exit. I got till that runs out. Somebody say amen. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 32. The people have sinned in the camp. They've made the golden calf. And Moses goes back up Mount Sinai and he begins to plead for the people. And the Bible said in the book of Psalms that had not Moses stood in the gap, in the breach, all of Israel would have been destroyed. And he goes up on the mountain and God says, Moses... I'm going to destroy all of them, and I'm going to start over with you. Moses said, uh-uh. You know what he said in Exodus 32, 32? Lord, if you will not forgive their sin, blot my name out of your book. Can you imagine that tonight? We're Baptists, not Jehovah Witnesses. We don't believe in limited atonement. I believe there's a spot for anybody, anybody that will come. I believe in full atonement. Somebody say amen. But can you believe being willing to give your spot away. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter number 9, he's writing to those in Rome, and this is what he says as he's writing to them in the first three verses. He said, I say a truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing witness in me. Listen to verse number 2. He said, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Do we have great heaviness and continual sorrow in our hearts? 
for those that are dying and going to hell. He said in verse 3, For I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren and my kinsmen's sake according to the flesh. Moses and the apostle Paul. You know what that word accursed means in the Greek? It means to be excommunicated. It means to no longer be affiliated with. It means to be removed. Moses said, Lord, if you won't forgive them, take my name out of the book of life. Paul said, I'm willing to give up my own salvation that they might be saved. Am I willing to pray that? Well, thank God it's not a biblical prayer. Thank God I don't have to give up my spot so you can get in. But I should have the burden that I would be willing to lay myself down that others might know Jesus. I thought about Luke 16. I promise, just a few minutes and I'm done. I thought about Luke chapter 16, more than Moses, more than the Apostle Paul. I thought about the rich man and Lazarus. Lord, been dealing my heart all week about this. The Bible said that Lazarus died. You know the story. I won't preach it. He said Lazarus died and was carried into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man died and was buried. And in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes and he begged that Abraham would send Lazarus to put one drop of water on his tongue for he was tormented in the flame. And I want you to listen to the words from hell. In Luke 16, 26, the, Abraham said, There's a great gulf fixed between us. And this is what the rich man said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, talking of Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest also they come into this place of torment. I don't just see the burden of Moses as a leader. I don't just see the burden of Paul as a preacher. But I see the burden of a man that is suffering in hell for all of eternity said, raise Lazarus from the dead that he can go tell my brothers and sisters that they don't have to come to this awful place. Can I say this tonight? If a man in hell has burden for lost people, why doesn't the church in Lenore? Do you remember days? I remember days as a little boy when people would lay on an altar or in their pew and would hysterically weep. For people to be saved. Can I say tonight, Don, I'm thankful for those that did not give up bringing me to Jesus. I'm thankful for youth leaders that came to my door every Sunday morning as a 12, 13 year old boy, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, uh, and they'd ask me, Matthew, do you want to come to church? And I would say, no, I'm doing just fine. I'm going to go play in the woods. I'm going to go fish. I'm going to play basketball. I'm going to go shoot stuff with my BB gun and my paintball gun. I, I don't want to go to church. And they kept coming. And I finally said, I'll go. And I'm so thankful that they never gave up. Are you? I'm thankful for family that prayed that I would get in. I'm thankful for people that never got up, gave up giving me to Jesus. Brother Tommy, Brother Rocky, would you come? Would you just play that piano just so softly, just that piano right now, until we sing Brother Rocky, but you can go there. I, I thought about this. The Lord reminded me of this. I, I didn't. It's not in my notes. Didn't plan to say it, but the Lord reminded me right before I come to preach. It was a long time ago, and Maze Jackson was preaching, if any of you listened to him. And he was preaching in a revival. And this little boy came. And he walked in that day, and the preacher preached on, if there's two people that will agree and touch anything, Jesus said, in my name, according to my will, I'll hear them, and I'll do it. Believe it or not, you know why I stand at the back door on Sundays? Because we're a small enough church that I can't but it's the tradition that pastors carried through and that I watched my pastor do, stand at the door and shake your hand on the way out. And that pastor was standing there and the little boy waited till everybody was gone. And he walked in and he said, Preacher, he said, do you really believe what you just preached? And the preacher said, of course I do, son. If you've ever listened to May Jackson preach, he does. He did. And he said, it's the inspired word of God. I believe all of it. And the little boy said, well then, preacher, my daddy is lost and needs to be saved. I'm willing to be number one if you're willing to be number two. That was Sunday night of the revival, story tells us. Monday night came along. That preacher testified that he really thought to himself, I don't want to let this little boy down. Well, thankfully, it was the Lord moving, not him. Monday night came in, daddy didn't show up, preached the revival. 
Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night went by. Uh, the little boy came in every day on his way out. He said, Preacher, I'm number one if you're number two. I'm believing that God can save my daddy. Friday night rolled around. Daddy still hadn't come. And I don't know why I'm sharing this tonight. The Lord just told me to. Daddy still hadn't come. The little boy was sitting on a pew watching the preacher preach. Maze Jackson testified that he looked at that little boy and he could see his countenance beginning to change as he realized maybe daddy's not coming. Preacher kept on preaching. There was a noise in the back of the church. The door flung open and in walked a man. Friday night, last night of the revival. The little boy stood up and he said, Preacher, that's my daddy. And that man walked in the church and he said, I need somebody to tell me how I can be saved. Uh, that man walked down, fell on that altar with Maze Jackson and Maze Jackson took his Bible and that man was born again. Why, preacher, why did that happen? Because a little boy in childlike faith had a burden of something that God could do and he believed that God could do it. I declare to you tonight that you and I, if we will get as passionate about winning lost people as we are about football, if we will get as passionate as we are uh, winning lost people about playing golf, and that, that one goes to me, if we will get as passionate as we are about fishing to win and lost people, ladies, I'm not leaving you out. If we'd get as passionate about winning lost people as we are about going to the store and shopping or making stuff or creating stuff, if we would get as dedicated for that, we would see God do something that only He could do. Can I remind you that there's nothing too hard for Him? Can I remind you that there's no sinner that He can't save? Can I remind you that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever think or ask? The psalmist declared in Psalm 1 and 26, 5 and 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Preacher, what's that mean? Jesus said, if you're willing to get serious enough and to weep for that lost person, I'm willing to move. Look at me tonight. I know I've preached a long time, but look at me tonight. Time is running out. Somebody say amen. There may not be much time left for that lost person to hear. There may not be much time left for that family member or that co-worker to hear. Think about this next time you are at the gas pump and the Holy Ghost says, Psst, talk to that person. Think about next time you are in the grocery line and your heart begins to beat out of your chest as you realize that that person needs to hear about Jesus. Don't be concerned about what the person behind you is going to think. But purpose in your mind and your heart that there may not be much time. It may be your last opportunity for somebody to come to know Jesus. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're able. I know what the general consensus of this is going to be, but by faith, I want you to show it tonight. Preacher, there is a lost person on my heart, and I need courage to tell them about Jesus. Raise your right hand. Preacher, I got somebody on my heart specific right now. I see those hands. Thank you. Put them down. Preacher, I, 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 need, I need help doing better at telling people about Jesus. I need more courage. I, I need more charisma to step out and just obey the Lord. If that's you, just show me a hand. Preacher, I need the Lord's help to do better so in it. I see your hands. Thank you. You put them down. I want to pray for you tonight. Here's what I want us to do in the house of God tonight. I want all of us to get a burden. I want all of us tonight to pray, maybe where you are, maybe on this altar, if God moves your heart, that He would help us to be the soul winners, the watchmen on the tower that He's called us to be, and that He would help us to win lost people for Jesus. Father, I thank You so much for Your Word tonight. Lord, I thank You so much that, uh, Lord, You've given us the responsibility but, Lord, what a great privilege it is to tell people about you. Lord, I need to grow in that. Lord, I believe that all of us need to grow in that. But, Lord, several of us have raised our hands tonight that there is somebody specific on our heart. Lord, I pray that we would pray for them. And I pray, God, that you'd burden our hearts again. 
and help us to realize that there may not be much time left. And Lord, we need to do what Paul said and cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light, clothe ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provisions for the flesh, and to win a lost world. Lord, I, my prayer tonight is not that we would have a prayer of being willing to give our spot away. But Lord, that we would be so burdened that we would be willing to do anything to get that person to Jesus. Father, I pray you draw us in this time. Amen. As we stand to our feet, tonight if you raised your hand, preacher, I need the Lord's help. I got somebody on my heart. I'm going to ask you tonight, would you get on the altar tonight? Would you call out that name specifically tonight? Lord, would you save this person? Maybe tonight you need to kneel and say, Lord, help me to have courage to tell people about Jesus as we sing tonight. Would you come? Come in faith tonight. He's able. Call on his name. pray for. Let, let me say this tonight and, and we'll close. Maybe, maybe tonight you need to grab somebody and say I'll be number one if you'll be number two. I'd be more than willing to be your number two tonight 
I know the person sitting beside of you, behind you, or before you would be willing to be your number two tonight. There's power when we pray together. Don't forget about the announcements, um, the trunk or treat. We're doing candy donations now. That's the end of the month. October Sky Festival is a week from this Saturday. Uh, Oliver Springs, the drama team, will be doing their thing there. We'll be doing giving away coffee and hot chocolate, I think. Um, so if you come, that hey, there's your perfect opportunity to give somebody a cup of coffee and talk to them about Jesus. Amen. That'd be perfect practice, good opportunity for that. Be mindful of that. Uh, this Wednesday night, we will answer any questions after the service about the renovation. And, and good Lord willing, I know it's fall break week, but Lord willing that the majority of our church is here Sunday morning, we will proceed forward in a vote about moving forward. The only reason I'm calling an urgent business meeting to do that is to stay on our time frame. We need to get things official and things moving. So be in much prayer about that um, and be praying for that. So here's what we'll do in this moment. Uh, Brother David, you come right up here. You got that basket? We will be dismissed at this moment, but if you are a Black Oak Baptist Church church member, do not leave. Uh, just hang tight for a second. If you're a member, be seated. We'll pass out the ballots. we got to do our deacon elections tonight. That'll take you two seconds to fill out. So we'll be dismissed at this time. Good night. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. If